welcome back to the Tech Factor podcast by Purple Quarter. So today in the house, we have King Shuk. King Shuk, thank you so much for doing at this hour. I hope you've had dinner because this is going to be a bit of, you know, we'll take about 40 minutes to have this conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to having this conversation. I'm well fed, so I'm all ready to go. <laughs> awesome. So King Shuk, uh, just for the audience to know that you did your BECS from Mumbai University, then you did your uh, MSCS uh, from Georgia Institute of Technology, and I love the way that you've managed to put yourself out there in multiple different domains. You started with gaming, then I think you moved to travel, e-com. Um, then there was Spotify, which is on the video streaming you've done of, between Spotify and YouTube. And then healthcare, right? Yep. Completely different uh, domains. How did you pick some of these? You know, if you can talk about the ones which are closest to your heart, it'll uh, really help the audience know how did you move. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, when when you sort of were going through like the chronology of how I made those moves, in hindsight, it looks like, wow, it's it's like, you know, a lot of different stuff. But in the moment when I started sort of um, working on different things, you know, the first few years mm -hmm. learning, uh, you know, out of grad school, um, uh, internship, actually, during the grad school, I did an internship in gaming because, um, you know, like any young kid, gaming is, you know, is very exciting. And also a uh, part of my uh, research during the grad school was in game AI. So it was partly gaming, but a lot of like AI research, which uh, gets applied to real-time strategy games and helps right. sort of build algorithms. Uh, and that led to an internship at Electronic Arts, which was fun. But then uh, uh, for the rest of my grad school, what I developed a keen interest uh, in was like building full stack systems and starting to learn a little bit about backend development for scale. And that led uh, me to joining Xperia working on their full stack and uh, definitely sort of led to another journey in Amazon, both of them locally in Seattle area, which was uh, pretty exciting because Amazon back then, this was the early days of AWS. It was one of the early companies which actually managed to, you know, make infrastructure commodity. So there was so much to learn from people around there in how to build distributed systems, uh, how to actually build things for scale. But right. then, uh, you know, I always had the itch to go to a younger company, a startup where you could really accelerate your learning. Uh, you could really sort of build things from scratch, build things pretty quickly. And I think the four, after the first few years of, you know, the formative years of learning things uh, uh, to sort of be built for the professional environment, I think that led to my journey uh, to Spotify, which was, uh, you know, a very young company back in 2011. Uh, Spotify had just launched in the US. They were a small Scandinavian startup and they were starting to see traction. Uh, and I was very fortunate to be part of that journey where I was one of the early engineers. You know, the, uh, uh, we were a small engineering team of about 100 people back then. And that was a fabulous journey. You know, it was a long journey, the longest I've had in my career, where I think my growth uh, sort of, you know, quickly transformed from just learning about how to build things from an engineering standpoint starting to think a bit more cross-functionally, like how do you think about design? How do you think about right. product hypothesis and actually build things out and prove those things out? Um, and that was a rocket ship journey. Um, and then having done that, you know, I kind of stuck to uh, multimedia streaming and generally like uh, media for a decade, like six years at Spotify, three and a half at YouTube, uh, which was fun because both are kind of operating in the similar space but are very unique and similar in certain ways and different in certain ways, right? Like one obviously started as an audio platform focused on music and then mm -hmm. sort of grew to like other kinds of content like uh, audiobooks and so on. Um, whereas YouTube's journey was quite the opposite. It started as a generic video uh, sort of platform, but then started specializing in certain verticals. Um, but then after like a decade in media streaming, you know, I wanted to explore um, healthcare because of lots of interesting, uh, you know, business challenges, uh, which basically through those 10 years, you know, I got a taste of like, not just building things, but understanding business. Healthcare has tremendous potential because it's a very complex field. Uh, you know, you can go in different directions and I'm happy to chat about like why I chose Cedar as, as sort of uh, the place to be. Um, but I think, you know, in the moment, the decisions were kind of, you know, like just to summarize, like start with, uh, you know, uh, the opportunities where you get to learn a lot purely from, uh, you know, your primary skill set perspective, like which is engineering. And mm -hmm. then as you start sort of picking up other skills, try and explore other opportunities, which, you know, provide you a little bit of challenge while also enabling you to leverage your skill sets that you've learned. Sure. 
So, you know, some of these companies that you've worked with are um, the larger ones, right? So when you moved into Cedar, tell us a little more about, you know, what really got you into a fintech. I know it's it's a little more complicated, um, yeah. if you may call it a little more uh, a place where it's still unstructured, if I may put it that way, and lots to do, right? But beyond yeah. that, if you can talk about what propelled you to look at uh, Cedar as an opportunity. Absolutely. So I've been kind of studying like the healthcare uh, domain for a while. Mm-hmm. And you know, if you broadly are wanting uh, wanting to get involved with healthcare, there are different routes that you can pursue. You know, so you, there are certain companies which do a lot of clinical stuff. Um, and you know, they're building technologies which enable to sort of improve the quality of care itself. The challenge in some of those industries are that they're highly regulated. You need to get, you know, uh, uh, food and drug administration clearance on a lot of the technologies that you release. Uh, it's also very prone to like, you know, uh, like, you know, litigation. And that basically means that things can be fairly slow in the amount of like innovation you can do. You know, it takes multiple years to make any progress. Hmm. And then if you look at the other end of the spectrum. There's a lot of administrative waste, especially in the context of healthcare in the US. It's a multi-entity system. You know, you have insurance companies, which are called as the payers. You have big hospital systems called as the providers. You have a bunch of other sort of, you know, middlemen in the middle trying to like facilitate delivery of care. And then there's actually like the people who are giving care, like the, the physicians, the sort of the nurses and so on. And there's so much wastage along this uh, sort of whole journey for any patient, uh, you know, to get the right kind of care. And this wastage can be eliminated by one, bridging like the gaps which exists, right? So like, for instance, in the context of Cedar, the problem that we're trying to solve is how do you bring like seamless financial workflows for patients when they're navigating healthcare? Uh, So it's primarily a, a, you know, a patient engagement healthcare platform where obviously uh, the financial foundation is very important. You know, we need to work with payment processing. We need to understand insurance. We need to understand, um, you know, how sort of uh, the invoices work, how, you know, manage refunds and so on. But in, in some ways, it's means to an end. The basic problem is that when a patient is dealing with all these different entities, especially at the time when they need to focus on care, it can be very overwhelming. So ensuring those workflows are very streamlined for them is is something that got me very interested as a patient you can relate to that you know sometimes patients have affordability problems of finding what are the different options uh, for affording your health care you know um, there's a lot, a lot of like affordability options that you can get even on our platform you can do things like payment plans and so on but you can tap into certain entities which exist in the u.s healthcare system which patients are not aware of so we connect them to those resources through our platform uh people when they're looking to like you know use their so Insurance is a big part of um, uh, sort of payment in the U.S. healthcare. People have a lot of these HSA balances, which is basically you pay as part of your employer's uh, benefit. Uh, you reserve certain deductibles in advance, and th- those go unused. And people are sometimes not even aware of how many balance, uh, what balance they have. So just sure. like streaming the, all of that workflow is very powerful. Um, and I think like those aspects um, were very uh, critical for me when I was considering new opportunities. So to your earlier question. Why Cedar? Because if you look at uh, attempts made by some of the big tech companies, uh, you cannot solve healthcare purely by tech. Healthcare mm-hmm. industry is so complex that, you know, one, you need to understand the incentive systems of the industry. Just slapping tech on it is not going to solve that. You need to work very closely with kind of different entities. And it's a very slow and methodical process. Um, and sometimes the way to solve it is not start big and then like, you know, become bigger. You have to start small, which often, in my opinion, you know, startups have that uh, sort of unique opportunity to start with a niche, figure that out, and then organically grow over a period of time. And that's the reason I think like we are seeing a lot of startups emerge in this space and over a period of time, you know, uh, grow in terms of um, the, the problem space that they're tackling. I love the part that you said that it's not about just slapping technology on health tech, right? Because, uh, sorry, the health uh, side of business, because I think you're absolutely right. It's quite complicated. So, you you know, I'm going to hold the thought about you talking about wastage. So, you know, uh, I would like to ask you, how has Seder uh, managed to take care of that wastage? To what extent? Yeah, I'll give you a very specific example, which is so tangible that, uh, you know, it, it hits uh, home for a lot of people I chat with. 
Mm-hmm. So often in the, uh, you know, the, the workflow typically is that, let's say you go to a hospital to get care uh, because of some regulations, but also because of the generally, uh, you know, uh, slow adoption of technology in this space. Till date, a lot of the people end up getting paper statements for paying their invoices for hospital care, right? right. Um, what happens is in many cases, you know, you get so much junk mail in your mailbox, people take these pay- statements and just throw them out. And even though like, you know, affordability is not an issue for paying some of these bills, a lot of the people who end up getting sent to collections, you know, because they've defaulted on payments are people with good credit scores, which is like, you know, such a bummer because it's not like somebody could not pay that bill. It's just that because the communication was so broken Mm -hmm. and then it's wastage because, you know, uh, there's this concept of dunning cycle. It's, It's a phrase used in healthcare industry in the US where, you know, people, uh, they get sent to collections after a certain amount of time. And leading up to that, which is typically 120 days since your first invoice was sent, um, the healthcare systems try and like, you know, re- reach out to you multiple times. So they'll send you another invoice in 30 days if you've not paid, then in 60 days and so on. So in, in an ideal world, if which we are supporting, like you can digitally reach out to the patient literally the next day after they had a visit, uh, sure. takes out that wastage, which is paper wastage, it takes out the whole process wastage of where patient, despite not having affordability issues, or in certain cases, even having affordability issues, is just not aware of the bill that they are supposed to pay. Mm-hmm. And last, uh, you know, in terms of just um, the value back to the provider systems, the healthcare systems, you know, imagine you're getting constant care because, uh, you know, let's say you are uh, uh, someone who's a senior citizen, you might have like 10 visits scheduled in a given month for different kinds of care. It's not easy to recall, like, what what am I paying for? Like, you know, if you're getting bills 30 days or 60 days later, you might see so many bills, it's confusing. Whereas, like, timeliness, you know, to get a bill digitally to send to you very next day, then you know, oh, I went for this care yesterday, and now I'm getting an invoice for it, so I'll pay pay for that. So I think in many ways, it even streamlines the, the user expectation as a patient and also, like, provider systems get paid right away. So I think, like, those are a few very tangible examples of how, Technology is enabling uh, sort of, you know, reduction of waste. Very interesting. How is the adoption though? Because if some of these patients are, uh, you know, senior citizens, are they able to understand digitally sent invoices and are able to do a transaction online? Do you, do you see that happen? Yeah. So that's a very good question. I think that's why you need to have like a multi-channel approach. So in mm-hmm. certain cases, as I said, like regulation also uh, requires you to send paper statements to certain patients because they might not have a- uh, access to technology. So you have to meet the minimum requirements of sending out the necessary paper statement communication while also augmenting that with text and emails. Now, in many cases, um, you know, depending on the modality of the communication, you know, you can imagine texts can be a bit tricky because there's a lot of spam. You might not trust yeah. that you receive in text. Emails tend to be more trustworthy. So you have to build that trust. But at the end of the day, when you get a link, we try and uh, keep our sort of workflow so simple and so easy to understand. And I think like that's where like the design comes in very handy, right? Like having simple and intuitive design enables people to understand what exactly is their invoice. You understand different options for making payments. You have multiple modes of paying for it. It's not just that you require a credit card. In certain cases, people just have bank accounts. So they do an ACH transfer. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, in in certain cases, people might even choose to send... uh, you know, uh, a check. So we need to have log boxes where these checks get sent and then we collect, you know, those and forward those to health systems. So I think you have to make it easier for the patients. And the hope is that over a period of time, you know, we can move most of uh, this communication to pure digital, but uh, it's fairly multimodal. Interesting. Is there any use of AI in uh, Cedar uh, in whatever you are doing uh, from a... Yeah. Yeah. Could you talk about so, that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, before AI, we've been using machine learning quite a lot, uh, you know, the traditional sort of, uh, you know, random forest approach or regression to figure out like what kind of discounts we can apply to certain patients who have affordability issues. So keeping that aside, since you are specifically about AI, and I'm assuming like, you know, uh, loaded in that question is like use of large language models. So right. in the context of like running a business like Cedar, we do have like service centers where you know we have patient advocates responding to phone calls and chat messages from patients, sometimes reaching out regarding understanding like their bill. You know, although the bill might be sent to them, they might still have questions like, hey, did insurance cover a part of it? Uh, or was it even applied? 
or like this bill looks, uh, you know, sometimes the language uh, could be fairly complicated uh, because, you know, these are, there are billing codes and explanation and they might want to understand like what exactly is the explanation of all these charges. Now, in those cases, there's clearly an opportunity, right? Which is where most people are applying like, uh, you know, uh, large language models. How can we bring efficiency into the workflows of employees? We were very careful that we didn't want to start by using large language models directly with patients or external users, because I think in healthcare, you have to focus on uh, user safety first. You have to focus on privacy quite a lot. You don't want to leak out personal health information or PII information. So our first sort of application of that was applying large language models in a more of a co-pilot approach to these patient advocates because they, at any point in time, when they receive this call, they have to open four different windows, try and figure out like information. And at times, you know, any person can have like a bad day, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, which means either they're missing out on information, they, as any human would, there are days where their responses can sometimes be very, uh, you know, let's say lack empathy for a given patient. So by using large language models, uh, what we're trying to do is that we can, we want to improve the helpfulness of the responses, scale empathy, and generally like give them as much information as possible in a personalized manner um, so that they can take that uh, output from the large language models in their workflows and then sort of respond back. So I think like that's the very natural, obvious use of AI that we are, we are um, starting with. And then over a period of time, you know, there are a lot of like smart uh, product solutions that can be built which we are sort of just experimenting with. They are nowhere near ready to be rolled out. Very interesting. Can you actually draw a contrast to the AI work that you would have done at YouTube and Spotify versus uh, Setter? Because you spoke about LLM so much, right? That you, you know, you're not, you're, you can use it, but you're looking at how the consumer will react to the whole thing. But on the yeah. hindsight, can you talk about YouTube and Spotify, how it worked? Absolutely. So I think like, you know, with healthcare, you have to be very uh, uh, sort of, you know, focused because of regulatory concerns and other things. So safety mm -hmm. and privacy comes first. I think with consumer platforms, depending on the nature of the platform and, and the specific use case, I think you have a lot more freedom. Like, you know, I, I've been using like the, uh, the DJ sort of application that Spotify released a few months ago where uh, the algorithmically are generating a lot of things and you almost have like a DJ companion compiling playlists for you, radio sort of uh, stations for you. And I think like that's where like a lot of interesting stuff can be done. Now, a lot of these companies are obviously using large language models to support that, uh, to also respond to voice and whatnot, but they've been using machine learning for a long time, right? Like a lot of the recommendation algorithms in the early days uh, uh, were based on firstly understanding the content and entity really well. You know, in, as I said, like Spotify and YouTube, although they look similar on the surface in terms of uh, sort of their value prop, because of their unique stats, you know, the way they've built algorithms uh, and, and packaged it are quite distinct. Because if you look at Spotify, right, like the primary entity you are serving is a song, which by na nature of uh, it being a song has a lot of repetition in its usage. Whereas when you look at YouTube, right, like, no video would get consumed like 20 times, right? Like there are a few videos, mostly music videos, if you think about it, which have repetitive nature of consumption. Most videos you would watch once and then yeah. sort of be done with it, right? Whereas that's not the case with uh, music. The other thing is, you know, in the ever since the start of like uh, music industry, music has always been served in a packaged manner. Back in the day, you would have radio cassettes where, you know, you would have an album served to you, then it evolved to radio stations and then playlists became a thing. A lot of the recommendation uh, algorithms are built around serving a collection of these music entities versus just, you know, one song at a time. That's not the case with videos because, you know, people consume long form videos on YouTube. So there are a lot of like practical considerations behind this, uh, which make the, the approach to solving recommendation fairly different because everything gets packaged in a manner uh, where, you know, things have to make some kind of a cohesive sense, right? Like either it's an album or radio station or genre or some kind of focus, right? Like you're doing a workout or you're doing a party and that's a playlist for you, right? Yeah. Um, whereas in the context of YouTube, uh, it could be anything, you know, you have to understand the user intent first. A uh, user might be coming to YouTube to consume news or it could be music, it could be a travel video, anything. So right. often like you would find a little bit of like, 
uh, 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 spread across different kinds of intents based on the recency, like, you know, in the past few days or hours, what was the user consuming? So there tends to be a lot of recency in their algorithms. And then once the context is established, when you start watching a video, you'll start seeing in the watch next, a lot of the content of the same type gets recommended because I think the intent has been established. So again, like on the surface, um, you know, um, uh, there is there is a fair amount of similarity, but underlying sort of mechanisms uh, can be dra dramatically different because of these sort of consumption patterns. Very interesting. So if, uh, you know, I did look you up on LinkedIn and I see that you file, you know, you have a lot of patents to your name. So would you want to talk about any one which took you a long time or, you know, I wouldn't want to say drained you away, but you very excited after you finally uh, got your patent. Do you want to talk about one of those? I mean, it's hard to pick a specific pattern because it's been a while. It's been close to 10 years since uh, we filed them as a team. I, I can tell you a little bit of the story of like what led to that, I, I, I guess, oh. you know. So I was focused on building um, the ad system for Spotify. And, um, you know, unlike, uh, and this was like 2013 time frame, right? So literally 10 years ago, um, back in the day, like the biggest until date, like the biggest platforms for, uh, you know, ad serving are Google, Meta, and, and you know, Amazon lately as well. And the way sort of they monetize the data is fairly different because they understand the search history or they understand like your engagement history. In case of Amazon, they understand your purchase history. In Spotify, like since there wasn't anything which was uh, sort of, you know, happening beyond the consumption of music itself, we had to we had to find novel ways to sort of figure out monetization based on the context of what a user is doing and what could be an interesting sort of, uh, uh, deduction of that in terms of how you would target ads, right? Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of creative ideas. For instance, you know, um, uh, can we insert an ad slot in a playlist itself? Because back in the day, um, a lot of the ads being served on Spotify were audio ads. Um, and over a period of time, we built like video ad platform as well. A lot of video ads started getting served. And the only incumbent which had the biggest ad uh, sort of uh, publishing kind of network um, or just, you know, ad sort of ad uh, inventory uh, for audio ads was Pandora. Back in the day, Pandora was the biggest competitor to um, right. Spotify. But the way they served ads was very territorial. So, you know, if I live in San Francisco Bay Area, I would listen to a lot of the ads that you would listen on your traditional radio network that go to this car mechanic and get your car serviced or like, you know, along those lines. And the the uh, the advertisers on Spotify were a lot more global. So you would have the Bacardis of the world or some kind of concert. Mm. So then we started figuring out the use cases of like, what's the intent of this user? So if they're consuming a certain kind of content right now or certain genre, or uh, if they listen to certain kinds of creators, is there some kind of commercial association that we can build out of that? And one of the reasonings we wanted to sort of tap into that uh, sort of idea and, and have a patent, file a patent was, uh, primarily, like most companies, we wanted to be very defensive because if we could build something and, you know, uh, that worked out really well, we didn't want, you know, the patent trolls to come and say, like, this is already something which has been done before. So I think a lot of the ideation initially was around, like, building these unique moments in which we could grok the user context, uh, figure out monetization opportunities. And I think, like, a lot of our ideas were based on uh, the understanding the music uh, context of a user and then sort of figuring out the ad inventory opportunities from that. Super. So if, if you were to look at it, I find this uh, extremely enticing that, you know, first you get the music on, then you build ads, uh, then you get the consumer to get onto premium and kill the ads, right? So um, Spotify has kind of managed to see what the consumer really wants, what kind of consumers do you get to see some of this at Seder? I mean, do you put consumers into different buckets or you know, how you want to do them from uh, from a usability or I don't know if it's from a preference kind of a stand of, uh, you know, viewpoint. Yeah. So I think like, you know, user segmentation is a very standard sort of technology uh, or uh, a technique for uh, building different experiences for different cohorts of users, right? Uh, so obviously we don't monetize user data because in, in the context of state rates healthcare data, it's it's like, you know, that's not our business model and we don't want to sort of, you know, uh, uh, be operating in that space. But the, the way we use segmentation is figuring out, right, like in case of certain discounts being applied, we, we have algorithms for figuring out, um, you know, 
and it's based on propensity of someone to pay uh would they uh, actually pay if we were to apply like some percentage of discount to their bills now again this is very complex because we cannot apply discounts ourselves we need to work with the healthcare systems to sort right. of make that but knowing someone's propensity to pay can be helpful because you know they might have affordability issues or other kinds of challenges sometimes we do cohort analysis even to figure out that um you know um are there different ui treatments necessary for different kinds of uh, users now we don't personalize it user by user but just doing cohort analysis helps us build better experiments where we can understand like the the pre and the post behave, behavior of uh, you know some kind of ui treatment so a standard like ab test helps so I, i think we do segmentation to that extent and then you know a lot of the segmentation also ends up happening for analytical purposes right figuring out um the the collection or the bill payment rate for users in different geographies and what are the macroeconomic factors which might be impacting that so you know the past 18 months have been kind of recessionary without actually being a recession which has impacted people's affordability in many cases because people have lost jobs certain regions are a lot more impacted so that's when cohort analysis comes in handy in trying to explain to our uh, 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 sort of um, uh, stakeholders which are the hospital systems of why they are seeing different performances for different kinds of like time frames and so on so i think like that segmentation generally helps uh, okay. gather a lot of so when you integrate with the insurance companies do you also have identity uh, you know how, how does the technology work for the identity issues that crop up i believe that there seems to be some form of uh, fraudulent activities that happen with identity thefts right so do they usually show up or uh so we the way we work with insurance companies is mostly sort of fetching the explanation of benefits data from insurance companies yeah. which is um you know sourced primarily by um so the way the flow works is that we get uh the patient information from the hospital systems the provider systems uh there are different like identifiers for that there is something called as mrn number but again those things are fairly unique to each provider system there's no like global mrn right mm. but tends to be like ground truth is often someone's first name last name date of birth and their social security number right so using these attributes you can look up the users in their respective insurance systems fetch the data and then sort of connect the users uh, the representation of users in two different systems the hospital systems insurance systems and build like a common profile for sure. us to share that bill with that user uh so to that extent you know it's all like uh sort of very secure calls that get made and we sort of match the data but there's no fraudulent activity here because it's all read data which is being used to sort of compile that information and then generate a bill uh so we don't necessarily encounter the kinds of challenges that certain other you know companies Got might it. understood so can we talk a little bit about uh you know because you've had extensive uh, experience in managing a lot of engineering teams so and also you've done product as well so i like the while you were at uh, youtube you had a very different title as well isn't it so you know which of course i saw it on linkedin so i'm just going to bring that up so whenever there is a product teams road map you know and the engineering team needs to also be in sync with how this entire thing is being done um where do you think who takes the lead in initiating some of these projects because there's i'll tell you why i bring this up because product and tech i always bring this up with most uh, people who have done both engineering and product because there's always an internal fight that goes between product and engineering so i just wanted to check what are your views on this one yeah i mean i've been fortunate enough to work at companies where for most part product managers have been fairly technical uh, right. i would say uh, you know it kind of varies right like so for instance um in most consumer companies even if the product teams are not technical they understand the technology well enough that a lot of the product building involves a lot of technical thinking as well right like nobody's uh, sort of you know uh, shooting random ideas which which cannot be built on foundation of the current technology uh, mm -hmm. often it's a very sort of iterative and and collaborative exercise so i i i would say like you know to the extent that product leads in defining the problem statements yes they do take a lead but the the framing of the problem itself the scoping of the problem itself does require a fair amount of engineering thinking and since you brought up the example of youtube right like 
I was lucky enough to work with a lot of product managers who actually understood to a great extent how the recommendation system works. Right. Uh, not at the level of code, but at the level of like, these are the different steps, these are the flows, where do we need to make changes? And without that technical understanding, you know, you cannot actually propose ideas which make sense. Mm-hmm. And vice versa, right? Like the strongest engineering teams building successful products tend to understand what the product goals are, what the outcomes are that need to be measured through certain metrics, and how do we build things and incrementally measure progress. And I think that sort of uh, back and forth is helpful in building good products. Having said that, you know, also I've kind of like, uh, you know, in the very first uh, sort of months of uh, my journey at Cedra, I did see that since, you know, uh, this is an enterprise business where Mm -hmm. we work a lot with external entities, a lot of the uh, product enhancement requests tend to come from commercial teams. Right. Uh, This was also true at YouTube, right? Like my team was focused on building products for uh, artists. Often we would get requests from music labels that why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? Mm. And these were very sort of, you know, uh, demanding requests, which obviously cannot be satisfied uh, purely by, you know, uh, sheer will, right? Like there are technical complexities or limits to the platform's uh, ability to do certain things. So I think like that's where good product managers kind of play a good balancing role and then they involve the right engineering leaders to sort of uh, figure out the right, um, I would say, ambitious scope, but grounded in reality, right? You don't want to sign up for things which cannot be done in a meaningful way. So I think like uh, those are some examples where uh, you would want to see that collaboration. You don't necessarily want to just follow along what product is uh, sort of dictating. Uh, and that healthy tension is is actually a great uh, uh, dynamic in, in those teams. Very different perspective. I like the term healthy tension. I'm going to use that the next time I talk to someone else. Yeah. So Kingshuk, uh, I've seen on LinkedIn that you've gone ahead and mentioned about that you guys are hiring. So if there was a potential uh, person who's watching the show, wants to join your team, what are the few things they need to keep in mind? Yeah, I think like um, at the end of the day, right? Like when you're joining a growth stage company uh, like Cedar, one of the key things that you need to be very focused on is uh, sort of be excited about the product domain and and the mission in general, right? Like um, often there can be a mismatch. I've seen people coming from bigger companies, you know, because of the 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 culture they've been in. Sometimes the goal can be purely like uh, how do I get promoted? You know, that kind of mindset would not be healthy or successful at a company where uh, pretty much like you know the uh, there's a lot at stake, you know. You have to like constantly experiment and take risks. You have to trust everyone around you. And I think like all of those things um, are necessary, but it's very hard to keep yourself motivated if the problem statement and the mission itself is not exciting because you wake up every day and you want to sort of, you know, make progress towards that mission. I think that applies to any company of our stage, regardless of it being in healthcare versus not. The thing I would say in in context of healthcare is that you need to be very patient because it's not a fast moving industry by design and for the right reasons, Mm. but also it's an industry which values uh, things that, you know, are very important. It values privacy, it values security, it values um, other practices, which are actually the best practices for, you know, running any kind of operation. So uh, I think like those are the parameters, but having said that, right, like the last thing which is very important is you need to have an ability to challenge status quo because when you are trying to, um, you know, by all means, I would say like, it's fair to say that healthcare industry is fairly uh, antiquated in terms of adoption of technology, right? right? There's so much more that can be done there. You cannot challenge a lot of the status quo by not being uh, a bit ambitious, being a little bit disruptive in a good way. And that does require a lot of intent. You know, you, things won't just happen naturally. You have to convince a lot of naysayers. You have to convince a lot of people by demonstrating results. So it's a combination of patience, a little bit of like ambition and, you know, maybe uh, challenging the status quo. And the most important thing is you have to believe in whatever product or mission you're signing up for, because in absence of that, uh, it will be very hard to sort of, you know, keep yourself excited. Sure. Since now, you know, because of the market turbulence, people have faced a lot of challenging times. What is your suggestion or advice to youngsters or, you know, people that you know from the engineering side of business? What would you like to say to them? Yeah, I mean, one thing I would say is that uh, 
especially in the context of if you've lost the job or if you've been laid off first thing is like you know um it's leverage your network don't panic and reach out to as many people i get so many inbounds from people uh you know not that i sort of uh, respond to everyone because sometimes messages are not directed enough so if you're doing those uh, specifically on that thing tactically i tend to respond to people and help them out when they are very specific in their ask and they uh, manage to demonstrate why they're interested in certain opportunities or what they're looking for right if you can like a random like linkedin message saying i'm looking for a job what can i do you know you're not helping yourself right. you know help someone help you so like people who say like this is my background i'm looking for these kind of roles can you suggest if you know there are good opportunities and uh, whatever you know else is helpful for me to enable them to help uh, them i think like th- that is like just important to just tap into your network in a meaningful way but beyond that what i've also found useful is people who are quick learners um uh, tend to um you know blend in well in different environments and cultures and and can quickly sort of come to speed uh, mm-hmm. we've had some great hires you know unfortunately uh, they were laid off uh, you know they came from different kinds of contexts and environments but since they had an open mind they were quick learners they were able to uh, sort of adapt to the new setting new situation uh, obviously with with the same set of criteria right they were excited about the mission they were patient and so on but despite all of that like being a bit more flexible and uh, having the willingness to learn and some of these people are not just young right like people who've been laid off they've been spent 20 25 years in the industry but right. still have that learning and growth mindset which is one of our cultural values those are the kinds of people who manage to sort of land on their feet fairly well and i think like th- those are the two things i would say because um when you are looking for jobs flexibility helps and the other thing is you know be very specific in your outreach but also reach out to as many people as possible wow oh, thank you so much for that i'm sure it help a lot of people looking for roles on linkedin and other social platforms during these tough times before we sign off kingshuk is there anything that you'd like to tell our audience would you like to share any life anecdote ah oh. that you know i don't know if i have a great advice for anyone <laughs> i would say like it's a very generic advice um everyone's careers has ups and downs uh you know everybody has challenges i think staying and this was an advice given to me by someone when you know you are sort of um facing challenging circumstances in any context right at job or out elsewhere as well like in in a particular project it could be in your role that uh find your true north star and be true to yourself be authentic in that way and when you follow sort of uh your true north star despite the challenges you know you build that inner uh, uh sort of uh 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 strength to navigate the the challenges and circumstances so i think like that's a very generic advice i don't know if it's helping anyone but uh, i would say that you know uh that's that's one thing which you know is is something that i've seen help me in the past so right I, I, you're you're hinting towards uh resilience and grit so i think i'll latch on to that myself as well because I think everybody needs that at some point of time in their life so it's excellent advice thank you so much for that king shuk thank you so much for being on the show it was really really lovely chatting with you i learned a thing or two about uh, the health tech industry and we'll stay in touch to talk more about how uh, things are evolving absolutely it was a pleasure chatting with you